You know what I like about you, Joel? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a, a dangerous beginning. I'm curious. <laughs> I'm sure there's a little bit of a, a twist. Yeah, there's a twist. Good evening, everyone. We are very, very honored um, to have Marina Abramovic and Joel Gamzu here with us today. I would say um, the greatest performance artist of our time, um, who has changed, for many of us at least, the way we... You're supposed to say this only after I die. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many death threats nowadays that <laughs> that's maybe... I died already four times this week, it's okay. At least, because you both worked together uh, for the past weeks and years, actually, uh, in performing The Seven Deaths of Maria Callas. So you died many, many times uh, these weeks. Let me say just a little bit about Joel Gamzu. You are a conductor, um, I might say one of the most gifted conductors of his age, <laughs> although I might only be able to say that after you die. I don't have any problem with that, so you can say it now today already. <laughs> good, good. I'm happy with that. Conducting all over Europe in the main opera houses and theater, um, music theaters in Europe. F also famous for finishing the unfinished Mahler Symphony No. 10 when you were very young. First of all, I would like to look at one of the fragments of the Seven Death of Maria Callas. Maria Callas different than performing as yourself? Let's start. First question will be why I'm doing this all? Why <laughs> performance artists are doing opera? 
I don't think it was an opera, but close to an opera. Yeah, yeah. close to an yeah. opera. Yeah. And if you tell me 10 years ago <laughs> that I will do opera, I think you're crazy. I will never touch this this really, you know, quite uh, ancient form of art because opera is very different than performance. But I think that after 50 years of career, I'm so secure in performance that I think why not try something new and different? You know, first of all, there are two things here. The one that I, I perform for every dead here in video, and then I also play the eight deaths, which is actually on the stage yeah. playing Carlos in her last, uh, in the bedroom where she died. But that play Carlos in the bedroom she died is very much mixed with my own story because the the photographs which I'm looking and they are not photographs of Carlos and Nazis and Zaffarelli and Pasolini and the, the, the people that she worked with. They're my own life, my own photographs, my own wedding, my own, you know, relationships, my own, you know, compli complicated relationship with the mother and everything else. So I kind of mix up the, her story and my story in one. So that was easy for me to connect. And then also Willem Dafoe, he helped me very much to actually explain to me how you can be in the character and, and play this character without actually thinking that acting is wrong, that I always think acting was wrong. Yeah. I think the theater is fake, you know, the public, you know, sitting in the dark, this, the, the, somebody's playing somebody else, you have to repeat, you have to rehearse, everything what performance is not. But you don't really play someone else. Huh? Not, I don't think this at all. No, no, I don't think anyone does, you, because you always do and you don't at the same time, because no one, no one, you always bring yourself to a character, even in theater. Yeah, but this, this I really kind of, you know, have to get into that. And I, I think I did it. I, in, in, every t in every of this scene, I was kind of physically and mentally feeling that I'm dying. And then we only made the seven deaths of seven characters of different theaters, operas. So we have Tosca, Treviata, Madame Butterfly, Lucia Lamamour, Carmen and all them. And then I'm feeling that something was missing. And this was missing the death of herself, the Carlos herself. And this was the one that I actually play her spirit more than anything else. And this is the only time that you really heard her, her voice in real. And the rest was on singers. But all these roles, Carlos play herself. And the idea was that actually in her mind, she'd been killed by the same man over and again. And this is Onassis, who actually broke her spirit. And she died for actually broken heart. And I felt this was the kind of interesting to, to actually only put the deaths. Nobody ever actually got this idea just to play deaths. That's it, end of the opera. I always, I always make fun that each opera is three, four, five hours, but the deaths are shorter. So this one is only one hour and 32 minutes. Not so bad. <laughs> you said, you know, um, Willem Dafoe reconciled you in a way with acting. And you said also, I think, in No Intermission, that the theater for you was sort of the enemy. Because uh, in the theater, blood was fake, and in performance, blood was blood. Yeah. And which was theater is ketchup. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now you know how to act. Did it reconcile you with the theater as make-believe or no, no, fake, I, I, maybe? I, I definitely think that the theater has its own magic and it's so important. And as, as, as a dance, as a theater, as an opera, and uh, to me it's so interesting to kind of cross these borders. Because right now, you know, I, I've done so much of the stuff of pushing really mental, physical limits already. So I'm interested to explore different aspects. But to me, it's also this work will never be possible without incredible collaboration with the great people working with this, in this piece. I mean, the, the, we have Nikodievich who created Marco Nikodievich music. We have Marco Brambilla who created all the generated clouds. We have the Petr Skalman who made the text. And then we have Yoel who put all this together. Because you know, for Yoel, is not easy this work at all because every time he have to deal with the different singers and you have to deal with a different orchestra every time every opera wherever we play around the world he starts with zero so i want to ask yoel how that works for you because it's not that you have orchestra who's touring around and know every note everything is a beginning each time yeah but i want to start from another beginning actually of where we started when we first met about this piece and I think that when I was first approached to, to meet Marina and to do this piece, the thing that hooked me, I didn't know much about Marina, but I've loved Callas my entire life. And that's what connected us right away. Because Marina, how many years have you been into Callas? When I was 14, start. So let's just say a while. And, uh, and for me, it's, I was even less than 14. Um, and for me, she symbolized actually the 
I would say the only interpreter I know who, as Marina says often, who literally died every time she went on stage. And you could say there was no, there was no catch up. I think that this woman somehow, a part of her died every time she went on stage, every show. And that's, I mean, you can only do that that many times. And that's why at some point in a very early age, when you give not 100%, but when you really give 150%, at some point the battery is, is gone, you know. She died of a broken heart. She died of a, also of the end of resource. Solitude, loneliness. Yes, exactly. And because she was the person who was on stage. There was no Kalas off stage, in a sense, you know. And I think that, that uh, the mixture of this absolute... It's not even commitment, but it is absolution in every way because there was no compromise is what inspires me so much. And I don't know any instrumentalist or singer or hardly anyone who had who really went all the way in that kind of way. And at the same time, she was incredibly strong and incredibly fragile at the same time because if you're not vulnerable, no one will relate to you as, a, as, a, as an audience. You, know, you only relate to people that let you see them also in their weakness and in their vulnerability. And I think that's what you both have in common in a way. And I think that's how we, we, started, we started through our love for Kalas and also are in a way a, a common commitment to go that path that means you will make yourself vulnerable, which means you will not only show yourself in your pretty side, it will not only, you will always risk and you will risk failing. And I think showing failure on stage is, a, is the most brave act you can do. It can of course become very, very vain, but in a sense, the daring to, to risk failure mm -hmm. is, brings you to the state of mind in which you can actually move people. I, I just want to say, add something. For me, it was very interesting to study Carlos. There's very few recordings of Carlos on the stage and some recordings of her interviews. But it was very interesting to see, actually to study, when she stopped singing, how, the way how she actually greeted the public. The transformation on that moment when she actually stepped out of role into her own self. She's this kind of fragile little bird. Her shoulders became small. She's all kind of bending. And it was incredible to see vulnerability the moment of getting this incredible charismatic the, the figure on the stage and re receiving the applause like a kind of divine shower. From and you see, that's why theater is not fake. Yeah. Because both of, these, because both of these people are real. She is both of those people in one person. But only the, the agreement that we all sit in a thousand people in a hall and we agree that we know that what is happening is fake makes it possible for her to get into the state of mind. That, uh, totally right. And then also the another thing that she's always resonated in my, in my head, the Carlos said, so important thing. She said, when I'm on the stage, I make sure that one part of my brain is in con complete control and other part of the brain frees free and loose. And only if I can combine these two parts of the brain, the performance is, is great. And that's she done, the balance of this fragility and the control. We just saw that fragment uh, where you were falling down and falling down and falling down. There was this beautiful picture. You, you're approaching this, the, the, the roof of a limousine. I think we have the picture up here. Let's see whether we, yeah. This, this picture. This is absolutely my reference. Yeah, yeah. Because that's a picture actually of the woman who fall from the Empire, Empire State, State Building. building. Yeah. She, just after engagement, she actually commits suicide. And they call this picture as the most beautiful dead ever. Because basically she fall on the car and look, and look like that she's sleeping. But the moment they want to pick her up, she was in pieces. But that was look like she's sleeping. You can see her stocking roll down. So uh, this is my uh, actually one of the references when I wanted to do this, uh, the Tosca, because in Tosca, you know, she she went from the castle in 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 different times, you know, and I don't know, 18th century, 17th century, whatever. And I think wanted to put in modern time, so I exchange that, you know, into the into New York and exchange into the car, yeah. the soul imaginary, and create that image. How you knew this? Because I watched it carefully, and I saw you approaching the roof yeah. of the of this limousine, the black limousine. I know that picture; it's an amazing picture. Good eyes. <laughs> and I thought, you know, it must be the reference of it, and that, it's the most the beautiful very, death. That's absolutely how it's called. Absolutely, the direct yeah. reference. Yeah, the, the the woman is called Evelyn. She's called, and she's uh, she died just when she was 24 years old. So um, there's many sort of these references in it. I mean, if you really look for them. Yeah, the Othello snakes who yeah. always appear in my performances. Is that sort of a way for you to compose your word of art, to sort of 
put things in it you know or you like or you you know, but this really, the idea of, the, of, the, of this piece was really to, to have some things that I have in performance already and to appear again in this yeah. context, you know. Yeah. Like Otello, it mostly is strangulation. He, he just killed her with his hands. And I, I actually have uh, four pythons in the snakes around my neck. Yeah, there's, there's huge snakes around your neck, and they're real. Um, you have no qualms about having these snakes? These, these are strong snakes. You know, when I done the first performance of the, with the, one of the snakes, actually the public have to come, and I have the person who was responsible for the snakes, and he told me something very important. A snake is tied around your neck. You absolutely have to not to fear, and your pulse should be very calm, because if the snake fear the pulse, she's just tightening around your neck. No pressure. No <laughs> And what happened, you know, what in, not in this piece, but in another piece, in the, the, one of the first performances I made with Snake, Snake actually slipped from my head and started going around my neck. And I was panicking. And he had no absolutely force. It's such a huge muscle to take it off. So he was telling, telling to me, breathe, breathe, breathe. And, and I had to calm myself. And then the snake just kind of whine out like a tree, like I was around the tree. It's very difficult to relax in a panic. I think most people know that in the audience. It's very the next thing to say is just don't try it at home. <laughs> I mean, don't try what I do. <laughs> so, so you actually put yourself in a situation where, you, uh, where it's very, very dangerous to panic. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's very important to have some courage as a performance artist. Yeah. I, I came from the parents, most national heroes. You know, I have to kind of prove myself. Because they were under resistance against the Nazis. Absolutely, yeah. no. yes. This is all about proving it to your parents? No, I'm going to, I'm going to tell <laughs> you a funny story. When I, I, I decided with Ulai to walk Great Wall of China, <clears throat> mm -hmm. I, very important for me was to call my father. Because my father, in the Second World War, there was in every book of history at that time in, in my country, <clears throat> they was talking about Igmanski March, this march through the mountain Igman. Mm -hmm. And that march was so difficult, and part, the, the Germans was following them, and there was these partisans that have to go through this huge mountain in the middle of winter of minus 25 with hardly any clothes, with the naked feet, we got no shoes anymore, through the frozen water, and there's so many people down on that side. My father was one of the maybe few hundred people who survived that march and came from the other side. So when I was going to the Chinese wall, I would say, I call him and I say, I'm going to walk the Chinese wall. And she, he said, but how long is this Chinese wall? I said, 2,500 kilometer, my part, 2,500 kilometer, all I part. And he said, but how long is it going to take? And I say, I think around three months. And, and then I say, you done Igmaski March, I can do this. And he looked at me and he said, you know how long was my walk? And I have no idea because this was history, this was legend. He said, one night. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I was impressed. <laughs> you know, the wall is mostly completely broken on, and only around Beijing and some cities are reparated. Otherwise, you should have to climb and you go through the mountains up and down. And I remember when I finished this, uh, one of my friends says, you know, who like me to separate, say goodbye. One American friend said to me, why didn't you just, why didn't you just make a phone call? <laughs> you're walking there, you're walking to, towards each other, you and Ulai. I was wondering, because you said, uh, this is a quote from Marina Abramowitz, contact with the public is absolutely essential. Because if a performance doesn't have the public, the performance is non-existent. Because if the uh, public is not there, the performance is non-existent. Is there an audience here? Is it the performance? No, the audience was just, you know, not there. And this was so different than anything else that Ulai and me done because in the non-existent performance, we, we just actually, it was even at that time, it was no social media. Mm -hmm. but, you know, people knew that we are walking this wall. So after we finished it, it was very important to me, in my case, to create something I call transitory objects. It was a sculpture that I actually kind of can make public see what I went through and have the, you know, and Ulai made his own work, I made my own work, mm -hmm. that we can include public in experience. But because what is the, the public point was where, not there. where the work becomes a performance? Is it the moment that you are doing it or is it the moment that someone else is perceiving it? No, to me it's important presence of public. No, but in that case. But there was no public. So exactly. to me it was, you know, we can call this action. 
you know, two of us actually walk towards each other, walking to say goodbye. And that looks like, like such a romantic love story. But actually, uh, we have now film, which become the work. But performance public was not there. And I think for me, is, is there's so many artists who can actually do performance in their own studio and then film it, and then present as a video mm -hmm. to the public. But to me, presence of public is everything. Well, exactly, that's what I mean, because exactly. the, the, the documentation of a piece, and the same, we have the same in music. I mean, I I'm personally, I, I resent CDs in so many ways. I think that a documentation of a piece of music is never the piece of music. And so even you know, people that have gone to a specific concert and then years later they listen to a recording of that concert, they're usually terribly disappointed because they had this experience and the experience had to do with how it sounded in the hall, how the, the, the person that was next to them, how they slept at night, their mood the day they came in, the magic of the co collective experience with other people. And then 30 years later they listen to a CD of exactly that performance and they go, well, it was all right but it doesn't have that magical uh, effect, of course. And that's something you can never reconstruct. I totally agree with you. To me, w this is why performance is such a time-based art. You have to be there to experience. And this is also a material form of art because when you bring home you c the experience, you can't hang experience on the wall like a painting. You really have to have, the only what is left with you is memory and you can narrate the experience to somebody else. But actually, it's all But that's almost emotions. like a new, a new work then. The narration. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's a new work. Yeah. yeah. It's funny, the like Aboriginal culture is exactly based on, on yeah, that's nar narrative culture. That's yeah. You say that in, in your book as well. That so but 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 wait one moment. So you're saying that if the recording is not so listening to a to a CD in your car or whatever in your room and is not art. It it is a documentation of a uh, one attempt of performing a piece. Yeah. But I mean, ag again, that we have to start with, is the score of a piece of music art? Yeah. I think the score of a piece of music is a, a collection of signs, of symbols, that are an invitation to, a, to go on a journey. They will be different every single time by a different interpreter, even the same interpreter doing it. There is no Beethoven Fifth Symphony. There is a draft or an attempt or an experiment at Beethoven Fifth Symphony that is happening every single moment. And it's actually the same, like you say, the moment that, I mean, it sounds like cliche, but of course the moment sound happens, it's already gone. So there is no a piece of music that is ever, ever finished. And so do I think the documentation of a performance is the piece of art? Absolutely not. Yeah. I think it's a, it has value to document it for, for historical reasons, but I mean, I, ne I would never consider a CD that I make, that's why I don't make them, uh, uh, in any way, not only comparable to the live experience, I, also don't, I think it's a completely different procedure. It's a, and, and so, and it's funny, I had an experience recently actually, um, I was, I, th I think I told you that last week, I, was, I just did a, a Carmen in Hamburg, yeah. The Carmen. And yeah. apparently a lot of people got very angry about the way I did it, which I still don't really know why. But uh, it seemed to shock a lot of people, although I never meant to shock anyone. It was just one reading of a piece. And I got so insecure after the dress rehearsal because everyone, there were people coming to me telling me it's the greatest thing they've ever heard. And there were people telling me it's the worst crime against music they've ever heard. And it was just these two extremes. And I thought, okay, well, something must have really upset people. So I s uh, there was a recording of that rehearsal. So I sent the recording of the first minute to a friend of mine, and I said, what do you think? I mean, is this, like, can I bring this out? Like, is it okay? And he's like, and he wrote me back, he said, listen, we have to talk, it's really kind of terrible. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and he's like, okay, well, yeah, you see, I mean, the tempo here and this there, well, it doesn't really work, and this problem and that problem. And I was like, oh my God, I have, I'm opening in two days, and my dress, I mean, it was apparently, the dress rehearsal was apparently dreadful, I didn't know what to do, and I could only do it that way. And I mean, I did it in a way, in a similar way in the premiere, because I can only do it the way that I believe in it. Same friend was there and he came to me and said, it was incredible, I mean, I've never heard it more convincing. I was like, wait, but I just did the same thing. He's like, yes, but it doesn't work at all. When you listen with your, sit with your headphones at home and you hear a dry, it's like, you know, when you take a flower and you put it in a book and you have a dry flower, that's not a flower. A flower, if, you don't, if it doesn't smell, it's not a flower. And so then, then I can argue the entire history of performance art will not exist if we have some kind of recordings, even in the shitty gray photographs or bad video installations in, in those days because camera was not great. But still, we have some. But it's, an, it's like an archive. Relate on. But it's an archive. It's not the piece. 
Yeah, but this always been, you know, archiving, always been documentation. It's very clear. Nobody claimed that. But there is also the work that you can perform in the front of the video and become video artwork. Or but that's, you, but that's you a can perform thing. in the front of photograph and there is a photographic artwork. But if you perform in the front of audience, then documentation is documentation. Well, that's the point. But that's exactly the thing because when you perform in front of a camera for the, as a video art, then the, the result is the work, not what was happening when you were filming it. But you know, to me, it's so the old story of documentation and real and what is not real is such a big deal. In, you know, in, and and very, lots of lots of thoughts I have about it. Like to me, with artists is present, I paid so much attention to actually record this piece real time. Nobody ever going to look this 716 hours and 30 minutes. But for me, it was important that I have real time recording for every single person sitting, and from the, my point of view, the point of view of the public, and then the frontal view. And as this recording exists, but again, you know, it's it's documentation of the piece. Who I will never repeat in my life, and nobody going to look 716 hours. But, but the, the fact that it's real time is important. Exactly. But the, so it's a documentation of the piece of art, which was when you had were there, when you were present, when yeah. the artist was present, yeah. when the public was present. Yeah. Would your state of mind be different in the moment of performing the piece, knowing that it's being documented, or if it wasn't being documented? No change at all. I was totally in the piece. I, I don't. I mean, this was just for me the prop set up, but my piece will never change. So it knowing that it's being documented does not change at all the way you. you First of all, when we start performance in the early 70s, there was a big group of artists which was actually thinking that we should never record anything. That is only life experience and is going to die with life experience, and that's it. And then we change our mind because we will not have history if we didn't. So, you know, we have to always think in our life to have healthy compromise. <laughs> and because also you have to sell something because you, I mean, if, if it's only time based and if it's gone and there's only memory, you have to, you live as an artist, of course. This is why I'm always talking about pyramid of, of art. Yeah. Music, the top, mostly material after performance and then everything else. <laughs> Come on, you should be happy with this. <laughs> Would you agree? I, I'm not, I don't really believe in hierarchy in this context, but I think there is, of course, the biggest, tr uh, let's say, tragedy of a performing artist, it doesn't matter if you're a dancer or an actor or whatever, is that you don't have, I mean, as a composer, let's put it this way, you don't have control over what your audience will see. As a painter, you present a painting, and of course, 50% of the process in the moment when the, your viewer is consuming the painting is happening in their head. But still, the artwork that you present, you have 100% control over what is to be seen. And as a composer, you write a piece, and I mean, to be honest, writing a full score of a symphony is, gives you so little control over the result as a composer. It's so interesting. You know technology, we are talking in 70s, I mean, we start with video, and it was always horribly gray and bad quality, and, you know, we never had money with little Super 8 sometimes, you know, to photograph or, or, or to film things. So documentation was really bad, bad quality. Then the tape was one hour. Then we all tried to make performances was exactly one hour that we don't have this break of changing the tape. So this was all conditioned in the 70s. Then came now 90s and 80s. And, and so you can see the most incredibly important the really historical pieces of art, very badly recorded, and you can see really shitty pieces of art on the absolutely high tech, you know, with a, such an incredible glamorous big cameras, and it's very deceiving, you know, but you know how that to actually, look things. But the recording because it's too good quality now. Every that's every, exactly the same every, thing in music. Every, every internet and any kind of you know, but you know image the, of the CD, the ability to produce a CD destroyed classical music. Because, you know, I mean, in the 1950s, when you wanted to record a symphony, you had an orchestra, you had a microphone, you p played a piece, and if you were lucky, you did two takes, and then you put that, and you p that was it. Nowadays, I mean, every violinist, you know, you don't even need to play the violin very well, you just play one note, and then they're going to glue that to the next note, and then they're going to glue that to the next note, and that's how you produce, and that's what a lot of people have in their mind. They get these CDs of these perfect performances that everything is perfect, all the notes are perfect, of course it's boring as hell, and then they go to the concert and they think, well, what I'm going to experience should sound like my CD. So all these young violinists, they work like, they don't take any risk in their playing whatsoever because they think they have to sound perfect like the CD. That's why music is becoming more and more boring for the past 30 years. The better the CD, the more boring the players. 
You know what I like about you, Joel? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a, a dangerous beginning. I'm curious. <laughs> I'm sure there's a little bit of a, a twist. Yeah, there's a twist. I like so much about Joel that he's so passionate, that he has so much fire in himself. And then he he really lit, live for every note of music. I mean, you hear things that nobody hears. You have this incredible precise ear that is very, really, really special. And you are never satisfied. You need perfection. But? What is but? Oh, I thought there was a but. I don't have but. <laughs> <laughs> but. No, back to, thank you. But back to what we're, no, but you see what I mean with the CD? You, you're always so pessimistic. <laughs> no, there's no but. You I want to change the subject? No, listen, but you know what I mean with the perfection of the technology. I do, I do. And, yeah. and, you perfe and you're, you're no, never satisfied. Perfection, perfection is a kind of utopia for you. For me, utopia in a performance is every single person on that stage being 100% vulnerable and risking also making a fool of themselves by giving everything they have and risking also going beyond their boundaries. Sounds that is, that sounds is for me utopia. Um, the perfection of, I mean, I don't think anyone ever wanted to pay money to hear a violinist or a singer singing lots of notes in tune one after the other. I mean, I don't know what, I would never pay money for that. And that's nowadays all you get, or mostly what you get. You see all these people and you go and it's, this very, it's a very clean performance of something. That's not perfection. And so what you mean, and I think you see that in rehearsals when we work together, and that is a big fight because with a lot of orchestras, you have people that have had a job for 30 years, they're very comfortable, they have a house and a car and a salary, and they, you know, and they think about their holidays and whatever, and they come and they sit like that and they, sort of, they, they tell, oh, what this, can this young guy tell me that I haven't heard before? And then after 10 minutes where they look, you know, it's like, okay, let's go on. You know, and they think they know everything better, of course. And it's always the, the challenge as a young person, you have to prove yourself. But another matter, most orchestra players do their job as a routine. And for me, I mean, routine is death, you know? And so you go in front of these people and you say, you'd want to wake them up and like, listen, there is no, there is no, you do the same thing you've done. Because they say, oh, we've played this for 30 years like that. Why can't you do it the same way? We've always done it. And that is, I mean, you just hear that you want, so the perfection I'm looking for is I want, the moment I see people refusing that the this, this state of mind of openness and the state of mind where they also really have to, because it's very easy to stay out of the puddle and stay dry, you know? But if, so people are refusing to get wet, I get, you know, you know? And that's the perfection I'm looking for. I know, so which I can summarize this, you know. <laughs> No, I, this is very simple. You know, you, you say, okay, this is good, it's not enough. It's great, it's not enough. Which is, you satisfied only the one thing. If you say, this is a wow, wow, when it's really. No, but it's also, if it's, wow. if it's not if good, it's, not bad. It's not about good or bad. Not it, great, it, it but wow. It has to be the only truth for that moment. But if, you, if it's already the same at the next moment, that it's in a way not the truth anymore because you can never reproduce the same thing twice. The day I will play a piece twice in the same way, I will quit. Actually, actually uh, some, somebody wrote about your art um, in the newspaper that oh my God. you were not capable of doing the same piece twice in the same way. What a compliment. Did someone say that? In, yeah. Oh, this in a Dutch newspaper? No, no, in a German newspaper. Oh, yes. really? Yeah. And, um, oh, lovely. I didn't know that. <laughs> and I think probably they meant it in a bad way, but they for probably me, mentioned it's in a, a great way. compliment. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, no, I'm not. Absolutely not. No. no. You go into the, you go into the, on stage and something in the air is different every time. Yeah. I mean, if you do an opera series and you have eight performances, or like now we did four, you know, Every time you walk on stage, you feel right away the musicians are in a completely different state of mind. Different audience, you feel it right away. The mm -hmm. first woman, in the, so it could be a man also, row three. <coughs> <coughs> I feel it already, different atmosphere. So, um, Joel said it's about risk, it's about taking risk. You must be thinking the same about performance, taking risk. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> There's n uh, and, but the fact is, the, 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 the important thing maybe about it is that you don't know the outcome of the live performance. That it's no, but it's not about risk so much. It's really going to the territory that you've never been mm -hmm. and also not be afraid to fail. And if you fail, it means that, that you just stand up and do it again. Yeah. And that's really, really important. That sometimes also watching the failure is for people more inspiring than to watching you succeed. Yeah. Somebody said that, that, that the success has to relate to how many failures you had in your life. Because that's every failure moves you a little farther. And that's something that we everybody afraid. And if you don't afraid of failure, that means you're repeating yourself. And you're repeating yourself is so boring. And then you, you just, you know, you, you please market. 
and consumption of art, and it's not what we do. Not you, not me. And it's creating it every time anew. You know, the, it's so interesting how the art became such a big commodity and yeah. is, is attached to big prices mm -hmm. and how few people actually don't care about that and really creating art because matters. You know, if you look this, like in old days, in the 70s, this beautiful little book, Patty Smith, you know, with the, her life with Marpeton. And in that time, called, the book is called Just the Kids. And the time of 70s and 80s, people was doing art because they wake up in the morning, they cannot do anything else. They have to do art. They never even think that they can sell what they're doing. They didn't think about my art market, they didn't think of any of these things. Because art was like a breathing. You, you could not stop creating, you know? And that's really true stuff to, that we always have to remember. Why is it important to make art? Because you, you might as well just consume it. What's wrong with that? You know, it's very simple. It depends who you are. If you're an artist, you, the art is like a breathing. If you're not an artist, you do something else. But, <laughs> but <laughs> I, this is all I know to do. And I'm doing 50 years now, and I'm not stopping it soon. Indeed, see whether there's people who want to participate. There might be. There's one oh. I'm going to ask a very simple question, because when I look at your art, I see you alone or lonely, not in a dramatic way. So I would like to ask, like, how do you handle loneliness after you perform? This is a wonderful question. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, when you do something really intense, like, like I just take, a, let's say, example of Artist's Present. This was one incredibly demanding performance for me. Every single day, it was so painful, so difficult. I was thinking, can I, can I continue? Can it be next day, next day, till I really finish? And finally, I finished 716 hours. It took three months. And I remember standing up from this chair, I felt that I'm changed, I'm different, something really happened. I went home alone, took a long, long bath, and I could not sleep, I could, it was like, I was in a, some kind of very, you know, it's not really loneliness, it's more solitude. Loneliness is something sad, you know, because you kind of feel alone. But solitude is something that is wonderful feeling, of being kind of with yourself, but really truly with yourself. The one thing when I've done any kind of different performances or opera, whatever, I don't like to see people and to talk about work. What all of what I like is ice cream. <laughs> this drawing to a close has been a long, long, long weeks for you. And you, you've performed how many operas in the past 48 hours? Four? <laughs> Um, so thank you very, very much both for, um, after that exhausting marathon, uh, to be here and talk to the public and be at the Bali. Thank you very much both. And we have a video of uh, Imponderabilia. Well, let's have a look at it. This is the Biennale in actually performance event in Bologna in 1977. It was one of the big performances in those days and Ula and me was invited. So we came with the car, which we lived for five years, with no money of any kind, with last liter of gasoline, knowing they're going to pay us something like, uh, I don't know, 300 euro, which was a huge amount of money for us. We could, you know, live for a while. And then we decided to make this piece that we rebuilt the main entrance of the museum smaller and create this entrance so they actually create the door of the museum. It's a very poetical idea, the artist as a, as a door of the museum. If there are no artists, there will not be museums, so we was a door. And we asked public to actually go through. If they have to choose one side, Ulai, or my side to turn, because they could not go frontally. And only when they come to the first floor of the gallery, they could see our choice, their own choices. The, what happened, actually, background is incredible. We was there for one week with, with other 12 artists building the whole show. And we all supposed to get this 300, 300 euro, and nobody was paying us anything. If we didn't have this money, we could not even get the gasoline to move away. So for us, it was essential to be paid. But every day, Italians would say, oh, this is a strike. Or yesterday, the, the cousin forgot the key from the, from the, from the safe. Or, or somebody was pregnant, or some emergency. It was always an excuse. So then, just like half an hour before performance, we both naked, waiting to start. Ulai 
at naked, totally naked, take the, went to the third floor of the office of the museum and opened the door and the alone secretary was sitting there. And he looked at her and said, we want our money. She was so shocked. She had the key right away inside, the, of course, inside the door. Take the key, open the door, and give this 300 euros. So now, 300 euros, the, in that time, there was a paper money Italian. This was such a big money amount. It was all in paper, a huge block. So he didn't know what to do with this. Now he's naked with his money. So he looked so look in the rubbish, rubbish bag, and he finds some plastic, and he put type everything in plastic and with the, with the little <coughs> rubber, you know, ready performance is going to start. So he ran into the, the main toilet and they put in the, in the top, you know, in the, in the water to float. So now I have no idea about all this and we are now start performance. And I see incredible worry in his face all the time. And I was thinking he was worried about performance, but he was worried about money to be flushed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.